So what I thought I'd do in the first session is to try and cover a few things. Firstly, just to, to recap some of the fundamentals of, of anti-leash manual immunity. I'm sure you're familiar with most of them, but, but just as an overview. And think a little bit about where the field needs to go in terms of, of moving us forward. I'll then spend a little bit of time talking about vaccines, because I know a lot of you are often interested about where vaccines are and where we are in vaccine development programs and then cover just a little bit about um, computational models, which is something we've been, been working on quite a lot of the last few years. And then after we've had coffee, we'll come back and talk about um, really where most of the excitement, I think, in the field is, and that's how we can manipulate the host in a therapeutic sense rather than worrying about drug development against parasites. And so this whole notion of host-directed therapies um, as an alternative strategy uh, compared to classic drug development. So, so let's just kick off with, with what I'm going to say in this first one. So just to remind people of what uh, probably 25 years' worth of immunology distilled into one slide um, as the sort of central dogma for how we control leishmania infections. And that relates to uh, the biology of the host cell, the mononuclear phagocyte, and how the biology of that host cell, particularly in relation to arginine metabolism, can be regulated through different types of cytokine receptors and cytokine signaling pathways. On the one hand, uh, cytokines such as interferon gamma driving arginine metabolism towards the production of toxic nitric, nitric oxide. And on the other, cytokine signaling through receptors such as the IL-4, IL-13 receptor uh, towards uh, the generation of ornithine, polyamines, and proline, which are pro-parasite products, essentially. And this is the extension, if you like, of the dogma of Th1-based immunity versus Th2-based immunity, essentially two different types of T-cells trying to drive the host cell in different directions, one that kills the parasite, the Th2, uh, Th1-type response, and the other which... Uh, allows a favourable environment for macrophage survival, and that's the Th2 <coughs> response. So this paradigm really, as I said, evolved since the, um, really the late 1990s onwards as cytokine biology expanded and our understanding of T-cell subsets expanded. But I think one of the most important things to recognise down here is that simple paradigms are usually too simple. Okay? And, and really, if you think about this, to explain the whole pathogenesis of leishmaniasis on this very simplistic concept is actually uh, quite challenging. So, of course, what immunologists did was to then bring more cells in, um, because if you can't explain something simply with just two or three cells, why don't we have more cells? And so now this would be a cartoon that's similar to, to what you've seen before, but expanded. We have multiple subsets of infected target cells. We have antigen presentation, the recognition of antigens from those infected cells by multiple subsets of T cells, not just CD4 cells, but also CD8 cells. We have the differentiation of those cells into various subsets of effector cells or memory cells, and understanding the balance between these is important for understanding uh, killing parasites, but also for understanding immunopathology, because these mechanisms here that, involve, that allow for killing of parasites may also stimulate immunopathology if they're exaggerated. And then we have this uh, generation of memory populations of cells which are important for uh, the anamnestic response, for why are we often only infected with Leishmania once, and they're also very important for understanding how we might generate vaccines. All of this can be negatively regulated, it can be attenuated if you like, there's a break in the immune system and it's simple to think about that break as being one molecule called IL-10. Uh, it's actually of course much more complicated than that. But even if you just think about IL-10 as the main regulator of this whole series of events, IL-10 itself can be produced by multiple cell types and undergo multiple rounds of regulation. Okay? So this is where all the non-immunologists turn off and just say, hey, this is too complicated, I give up, okay? Um, which is fine because some of us enjoy this stuff, but, but some of you probably don't. Okay. So depending on your, your flavour as an immunologist, you always have a certain bias in interpretation. My background is in myeloid cell biology and in antigen presentation. So I would argue that I could explain all of the regulation of the immune response 
by thinking about how parasites interact with antrum presenting cells. And I've just listed a few of the uh, published items that are out there. We, we know that Leishmania actually has relatively weak abilities to innately stimulate macrophages. Uh, we know that, that metabolic shifts occur when macrophages become infected. And we also know that the whole, whole animal undergoes metabolic shifts during infection. And these can affect antrum presentation. We know that there are discrete cell biology pathways that can inhibit T cell activation. And I'll talk more about some of these signals uh, later on uh, this afternoon. <coughs> but again, this is a slightly biased snapshot of the immunological world because it comes from the standpoint that antrum presentation is the key driver. Um, if I was to take uh, another immunologist and swap myself over, you would probably get a different slide that says, no, actually, it's all about this cytokine receptor or it's all about this cell signaling pathway. So you've got to be aware that we all have our own biases in how we look at the literature and how we design experiments. I think one statement I would say is absolutely true, though, whatever bias you have, and it's something we forget when we study immunology often, is that timing is absolutely critical and space is absolutely critical. Where it happens and when it happens is actually equally as important as whether it's this cell type or that cell type. And in fact, your perception of whether it's this cell or that cell often reflects how you measure things in space and in time. Okay? And that's really challenging when we start to look at human immunology, particularly where many of the really important things happening in the immune system are not accessible to tissue sampling. And we're working spatially discrete environments, often the peripheral blood, uh, to try and understand what's happening in very diverse tissues. So there's some good reviews so on all of these slides. There'll be various references if you want to go back. So, so Chris Engward, or an old colleague of mine, uh, wrote a very nice review on, on this, which is where this cartoon comes from. I, think. <coughs> I should mention what are the new players on the, on the block. Probably the new players in the last uh, four or five years are TH17 cells, cells that produce this cytokine uh, interleukin-17 that's intimately linked with the neutrophil response. And uh, we've heard a little bit about neutrophils from Jesus. I'm sure we'll hear a bit more about neutrophils later on. This is equally as complex. And, and I really just draw your attention to this down here. This is a great title for a paper. How many of us write a paper which is saying, actually, it's equivocal? We don't actually know what we're really talking about. Okay? And, and one, of, one of the things I just want to mention here, which is really important, and, it, and it's, a, it's well exemplified by the TH17 field, lots of cytokines can be made by lots of different types of cells. If you take a culture supernatant from a mixed population, or if you take a lesion biopsy, and you see some IL-17, the current dogma is to write a paper saying TH17 cells are important in leishmaniasis. There are other sources of IL-17. If you don't assay what your, your cell types as well as your cytokines, you can get into a real mess in understanding. So please, everyone, beware that, that although we attribute these cytokines to different types of T cells, just seeing the cytokine doesn't mean you've got that type of T cell. There can be other types of producer cells uh, that can confound this. So the IL-17 produced very often during a whole range of chronic inflammatory diseases that have nothing to do with IL-17 cells um, because it's a cytokine involved in uh, organ remodeling. Okay, so that's just a word of warning. Um, another complication, I guess, in the last four or five years has really crept into our field and, and uh, exemplified by this very nice paper from David Sachs's lab um, just last year is that we used to have the, the notion that all macrophages and were derived from blood monocytes, and blood monocytes were always derived from a bone marrow precursor. And for any of you who follow that field of macrophage biology, will know that we now have two distinct lineages of macrophages in, in circulation in the tissues. We have those that do in fact derive by hemopoiesis from the bone marrow, but we have some that derive directly during embryonic development from precursors of uh, yolk sac derived. And these have quite different biology and they have quite different biology that's imprinted in different tissues. And one of the really nice things about this paper here that, that uh, came from the Sachs lab is to show that not only can leishmania live in some of these cells, but these cells can express phenotypic characteristics, in this case of a M2 or a 
IL-4 activated macrophage, even though it ne doesn't necessarily see that particular type of cytokine. So you can have cells in a Th1 rich environment behaving like this something else purely because they are cells of a different origin. Okay. And that really changes our perspective on how macrophages and, and myeloid cells behave in infection. Okay, and so the last thing I just want to point out before I go on to uh, vaccines, really, is this little set of cartoons here, which we did as a sort of a, a bit of an exercise in the lab, and, and in fact the paper will come out hopefully in a few weeks' time. Um, how good are your models? What do we really look at? So this is just transcriptional profiling of, of essentially all of the uh, mammalian transcriptome. In a mouse that has visceral leishmaniasis, and a hamster that has visceral leishmaniasis. They're not perfect comparisons because the methodology is a little bit different, but I think the basic message is there. There's a subset of genes that are regulated during infection in both hamsters and mice. And not surprisingly, most of those are related to interferon gamma and, and pathways regulated by interferon gamma. But there's a lot of stuff happening in hamsters that doesn't happen in mice. And there's a lot of stuff happening in mice that doesn't happen in hamsters. If you take these cartoons down here, this is now whole blood analysis comparing mice in blue with humans in yellow. Again, we can't match perfectly because I know when I infected my mouse, but the clinician doesn't exactly know when the patient was infected with leishmania. But let's just take them as model systems. Less than 5% of the genes are co-regulated between mouse and humans during this leishmaniasis. So what that tells us about models is that they are indeed models. Okay? We have to be very cautious how we interpret them. It's not to say we shouldn't use mice and we shouldn't use hamsters, because they fundamentally tell us how the immune system can talk to each other in different ways. But as soon as we start to translate and say, is it this cell, is it that cell? Will this drug work or will this drug not work? We have to remember that these are all models and that humans may well behave quite differently. What you're probably thinking about, because I've already mentioned it before, is what would happen if we compared human spleen with hamster spleen, with mouse spleen? What would happen if we compared human liver with mouse liver? Or even hamster blood with human blood? And unfortunately, we just don't have the data. It's not there. Okay? And so that's something I think we should really look forward to over the next year or two, hopefully, because I know people are collecting that data, uh, to see how these pictures change when we start measuring organ for organ, different forms of models versus human disease. And of course, this is visceral leishmaniasis, these humans. What about all the other forms of leishmaniasis? And what about the asymptomatics versus the PKDLs versus uh, Brazilian, uh, Brazilian Leishmania, Donald, uh, Leishmania uh, visceral leishmaniasis versus uh, visceral leishmaniasis elsewhere in the world, for example. So I think what it tells us is we still need to do a lot of comparative work across species. But I think this next slide actually just um, introduces something which you might all want to, to look at. Um, it's the, outshot, uh, the upshot, really, of a large amount of funding that's come into the UK over the last year or two to set up a variety of networks for expanding our knowledge of infectious disease. And very importantly for all you guys is it's a way of giving out money to people in countries such as you all come from, and it's a way of giving out money particularly to young investigators. Now we're getting excited, you see. There's money here. So the first one is called the Validate Network, and this is a vaccine-related network. And its central tenant is that we need to know more about disease, pathogenesis, if we're going to make effective vaccines. But we should also learn from thinking outside of just leishmaniasis. So this is a great meeting, but one could argue it would be enriched if half of the group came from the field of tuberculosis, or half of the field came from studying intracellular bacterial infections, for example, because there's a lot of things we can learn across different species. And so Validate is actually a network to try and bring together people working on leishmaniasis, tuberculosis, melioidosis, and leprosy. And just to look for what might be common and similar between those diseases or might be different. Uh, because they actually have similar intracellular habitats, they have 
granulomatous inflammation as a common pathway for pathogenesis. So I would encourage you to, to click on this link down here or go to this website. You can join Validate, it costs you nothing. Um, but if you're PIs and, and through this you can apply for pump priming for small projects, you can apply for mentorship, so you can get a mentor in another country who can help you develop your career. Uh, and there's also a whole host of sort of background information about, um, about the network that you might find interesting. If vaccines don't do it for you, there is another one, which is drug related. This is called the Neglected Tropical Diseases Network. This is run out of Durham University and the University of York. This one's a little bit more restricted because if you can't recognize your logo here, you can't get any money from them. But if you can recognize the logo or know someone who's associated with one of, one of these logos, and this is mostly, unfortunately, Africa is not involved in this one. I don't know why, but it isn't. So this is mostly Brazil, uh, Argentina, uh, Europe, and India. Um, so no African component in this. But if you're up here, then again, this is about pump priming, early career support, mobility, um, getting money out into developing countries to try and expand our knowledge, and particularly around Chagas disease and Leishmaniasis, this particular one. Okay, so let's just move on and, and give you a quick update on where we are with vaccines, because vaccines are um, clearly something that we've talked about always as being the big solution for leishmaniasis. Not just for visceral disease, but also arguably, more importantly, for some forms of cutaneous disease. And leishmaniasis vaccines are an interesting field. There's been around about the last time we counted, somewhere about 200 different studies published on different types of vaccines in animal models. There's over 100 patents registered on molecules that could be involved as vaccine candidates for leishmaniasis. And yet there's probably less than 10 molecules that have ever gone near a person as a vaccine screen. And so actually it's quite encouraging at the moment that we now have the richest list of vaccine candidates close to the clinic. We have this one up here, which I'll talk about uh, in a little bit more, which is the only one currently, as far as I'm aware, that's actually in the clinic, and this is a phase two therapeutic. It's a viral-based vaccine. We have a recombinant vaccine with an adjuvant that comes from Steve Reed and the IDRI group. Uh, we have this one here, which you may talk a little bit, are you going to talk about that? Yes, yeah, so Hesis will talk a little bit more about this one because it's not only an interesting uh, way it's been constructed, but it also contains some sandfly antigens, so, so one sandfly antigen. So, so I think you'll hear more about that one. This one is, is funded through to the phase one clinical trial, as far as I know. We have a live attenuated vaccine that's being developed by um, Greg and, and uh, here in the Cassie at, at um, NIH. A and also we have uh, this DNA type vaccine. So for the first time, we've got <coughs> five vaccines either in the clinic or near to the clinic. And very importantly, they all share at least one component, which actually gives you quite a lot of combinatorial power in, if you think about combining vaccines together at a later date. So I won't say any more about this one or, or these. Um, others might mention them. Uh, and I'll just concentrate a little bit on where we are with, with this one at the top. So this is a, a therapeutic vaccine that's designed mainly for therapy rather than prophylaxis, but it's not to say it wouldn't work for prophylaxis, and I'll mention that at the end. It was designed to have two antigens in there. Why two? Well, if you go for one, that's putting all your money in one basket, so no one ever goes for one antigen. If you go for more than two, you could have three, you could have four, you could have five, but there are complexities that build up with that. So, so two is a nice, simple number. Um, this one here, KMP11, is generically expressed across all the trypanosomatids and is really invariant. This one here, the HAS-B, is in all the Leishmania, with the exception of the Brasiliensis complex. And although it has some complications in its repeat structure, uh, we designed a synthetic version to get us around that problem. We only wanted to inject people with one vaccine, not two separate vaccines, so we linked these two constructs together with a what's called a viral 2A sequence, and that allows uh, co-translation of the single product, and then self-cleavage, so you get two independent uh, polypeptides. We put it into a particular vector because we were particularly interested in trying to generate CD8-type T-cell responses, 
And the reason for that is that we know that in many forms of chronic leishmaniasis, there is a phenomenon called CD8 T cell exhaustion, where it looks like the CD8 T cells are just not able to fulfill their function properly. And so we wanted to drive CD8 T cell responses and see if we could re-stimulate them. And so we've used this vector here, which is an adenovirus. It's a, a simian adenovirus called Chimpad 63. And the advantage for us there was that it had been in thousands of people already as part of malaria and TB and HIV vaccine programs. So we had good safety data on this particular platform. We did the usual mouse models, but you'll see that actually the mouse models are rather irrelevant for the targets that we're actually looking at. Um, and then we did a phase one study in humans. And a phase one study is what we do to evaluate safety of, an, of a new medical product. Okay? So it's a small number of patients, and your primary outcome is, is it safe? And so we did that study in the UK in, in healthy volunteers, uh, not all students, I should add. They're just healthy volunteers who, who participate. And the safety of this is, is very good, actually. What you can see here are what we call grade one and grade two adverse events. A grade one adverse event would be a little bit of redness, or if you like, around the injection site, the thing that you've all had when you've been vaccinated. A grade two event would be something that probably needed a paracetamol. You had a bit of a headache afterwards, may have to have sat down for a few minutes. Um, and the important thing is to avoid what we call grade three or grade four events. Um, grade four, not surprisingly, are fatalities, and grade threes would be severe systemic type responses. <laughs> So in, in vaccine terms, this is as safe as any vaccine that you would normally have in terms of the, the impact it has. It makes really good T-cell responses, so we use an L-spot approach to count the numbers of T-cells to different sections of the, end, of the molecule, and both, both components of the vaccine were immunogenic, uh, and this is a little bit of a complicated chart here, but it just shows you how many, what proportion of, of the T-cell response uh, is multifunctional, makes more than one cytokine. And most of these T cells either make one or two of the cytokines or occasionally pairs. Very few of them make triples. So we had, after about five years of development, we had a vaccine that had gone through early clinical testing. It was safe. It could be used in various indications. Big question now, what form of leishmaniasis do you try this in? Because unlike malaria, unlike tuberculosis, we have a whole range of different forms of leishmaniasis to, to deal with. And so we particularly have always been interested in Donovani-associated disease. But even if you think just about Donovani-associated disease, there are many different ways you could use a vaccine. We've heard a bit about transmission, subclinical disease, active calorizar, PKDL. What do we want a vaccine to do? Obviously, if it was a prophylactic vaccine, we want to stop infection here so none of this happens. But in a therapeutic setting, do we want to make subclinicals stop transmitting? Do we want to stop subclinicals become VL patients? Do we want to stop VL patients becoming PKDL patients, et cetera, et cetera? How do you make those choices? Well, sometimes you have to make those choices for scientific reasons, and sometimes you have to make them just for pragmatic reasons. Okay? And if you think about vaccine development, as an immunologist, I could always say, I could spend another five years making my vaccine a bit stronger, a bit more potent, I could do something to play around with the immunology. But actually, we don't know what we need. Okay? We don't know whether it needs to be stronger or of a different type. So we could think about quality and quantity, but actually, it's often it becomes something to do with practicality, pragmatism. What would be the rate of return? Can I ask the funder to give me another five million pounds for five years while I play around with more mice? Can I ask the funder for me to, do, to fund $10 million for a field trial where I might get a result in five or 10 years' time, or transmission might be quite low that year and I suddenly find I have an underpowered study uh, which tells me nothing. So there are issues like that. There are issues of manufacture, of cost, of compliance. Over here, any immunologist will tell you priming and boosting gives you a stronger immune response. Any field worker will tell you, once you've injected someone once, finding them again a month later to give them a boost is actually quite tough, particularly if they're in a nomadic situation. Okay? So there's a lot of pragmatic choices. So what we did was to, make, to think about those choices and to think about post-calorizal dermal leishmaniasis. Because post-calorizal dermal leishmaniasis, 
is a very important health issue in its own right, particularly in, in Sudan and in the Southeast Asian continent, not so much obviously in, in South America. We know a little bit about the pathogenesis of disease, but not a huge amount. But we do know that when you get PKDL, particularly in, in East Africa, you can be self-healing, but you can also get a non-resolving, non-self-healing form of PKDL. And we have some data which suggests that this might be ameliorated could we increase the amount of CD8 T cell activity. But the pragmatic thing here is that if you've got a, a non-self-healing population and they're all infected, your sample size for a clinical trial becomes very small. In fact, we can do a clinical trial, as, as I mentioned to you that we're doing now, and get an efficacy study completed probably in about two and a half years with about 90 people. If you were trying to do a prophylactic study, it would probably be many thousands of people, as I've said, over many, many years. At the mercy of, do they actually even get infected, is transmission up? We don't have to worry about transmission efficiency. These are all patients. Okay? Uh, we don't have to worry so much about compliance because they're patients and we can follow them up easily. So what we decided to do was, was to do a study in Sudan in post colorazar dermal ischemiasis. We're working uh, just uh, to the southeast of Gedereth in a place called Duka, uh, near the Ethiopian border. It's about 600 kilometers or so from Khartoum. Uh, it's in a center that was set, uh, set up by the Institute of Endemic Diseases, who are our main collaborators for this work, uh, Ahmed Musa and his team particularly. And there are some other things here which tell you why PKDL is actually quite a good vaccine target. There are no animal models. So no regulator can tell you to go back and say, do more animal models. So there aren't any animal models of PKDL. It's chronic, but it's not life-threatening. If I want to test a vaccine in, in visceral leishmaniasis, I can't withhold the drug from someone who is critically ill just to see whether or not my vaccine works. So I would always have to vaccinate someone and give them drug at the same time. And you've already heard Ambisone is giving 95% or so uh, effectiveness. How can I see an extra 1 or 2% above that that my vaccine is improving? I need thousands of patients to do that. Here we have an ethical window of opportunity, and this is actually what they're called. And this is you'll find in the cancer field and in, in the uh, autoimmune field, we talk about window of opportunity trials. Can we safely intervene withholding conventional therapy? wait a few weeks and see if we get a clinical response, and if we don't, we come back with conventional chemotherapy, or whatever that option is. And so these window of opportunity trials are really important, because they allow us to do small-scale studies in, a, in an ethically uh, acceptable way. So the study we set up is, is basically this is a standard study for an early phase clinical trial. It's a patient population that's never been vaccinated before, so we do a small safety study, um, which is, is essentially uh, vaccinating these individuals once, waiting 40 to 90 days. If they develop, if they've still got PKDL, we treat them. If by chance the vaccine has cured them from their PKDL, then obviously we don't treat them. And then if that safety study works, we go into what's called a, a randomized control trial against a placebo, a blinded study, uh, where you essentially do the same protocol. And we have preclinical endpoints that are established, so if there's not more than 75% uh, efficacy out here in terms of an individual, and this is a, a bit of a subjective score, PKDL is quite a diffuse disease, so you have a subjective score of, of has this improved by 20%, 50%, 80%, whatever. Um, if it's less than 75%, we treat. If it's if it's in between 75 and 90, we give the patient an opportunity to wait to see if the vaccine has done anything else later on. And if there's more than 90% improvement, we essentially say the vaccine is, is efficacious and we don't treat that individual. Where are we in this study? Well, we're now uh, almost finished the, the, phase one, the phase 2A safety study. It's been well tolerated. There are no grade threes or fours, so it's safe in patients, which is the important outcome. I'll show you this data in a second. Preliminary data says the immunogenicity is good in these patients. And I think we should be finished, in fact, in about two weeks' time on the last part of the cohort. And then we will go into the randomized control trial uh, afterwards.
And this is just a snapshot of the sort of data. And this is, LEASH-1 is our UK study. This is the immunogenicity for the individuals in our UK study. And this is for the first group that we've analysed to date of uh, the patients. And so you can see their CD8 T cell response to vaccination is on par with our healthy volunteers. And in fact, their mitogen response is, is on par, if not a little bit better than our healthy volunteers. Where else could we use the vaccine? So I said we've got one option, this is therapy in PKDL patients. <clears throat> but of course, by the time they become a PDL, PKDL patient, they're already potentially transmitters, or not, depending on how the discussion was this morning. They've already had long-term chronic disease. So from a public health perspective, preventing PKDL is actually a much more sensible option. Uh, blocking this transmission line here, rather than necessarily just treating patients once they've established. So we've just received funding from the European Union, which is pretty good, people in the UK these days. Um, so we've just got funding from the uh, to set up a, another study, which is now a prevention study. And the way this protocol will work is that we will give back visceroismoniasis patients conventional treatment and then vaccinate them at the end of their treatment to see whether the vaccination can protect them against that development of PKDR. And our rationale here is that more CD8 T cell responses make clear parasites from the skin that have accrued during visceroismoniasis and that therefore might resist, re, you know, sort of limit the amount of PKDR that develops. And so this is a, a typical EU grant, so it's a much more complicated grant than the ones we do funded by, by England. Um, we have our first safety study here. That leads into a randomised control trial. We have to make another batch of vaccine as we do this. Uh, but also importantly, we're taking this as an opportunity to set up a new centre of excellence across East Africa for flow cytometry. Because one of the major issues with immunology, for anyone who's done immunological assays, whether it's an ELISA, whether it's a flow cytometry assay, whether it's um, any other type of T-cell response, is you pick up the paper and you look at the paper that someone's published and you say, a thousand units of X? I've only got 400. And you don't know if you're doing the experiment the same way. You don't know whether it's a quality control issue. You don't know anything about that. We're very, very poor at that in this field. I slap my own wrists, but I slap probably everyone else's wrists here. We're very, very poor at standardisation. If you work on HIV or you work on malaria or you work on TB, 100 spots in one lab is pretty much identical to 100 spots measured in somebody else's lab in a different trial. We can't do that. You, you pick up any 10 immunology papers from the Lishmania clinical field and try and make sense of the data comparatively. You can't do it. And so we're setting this up to, to make sure that at least for flow cytometry and cytokine analysis, when we do studies in different parts of Africa and hopefully ultimately in, in South Asia and, and in, uh, in Brazil, that we're actually measuring the same thing in the same way, in a way that we can interpret. And that's really critical um, that we do that, I think. Okay, I just want to go on to one really sort of exciting area, which, which is um, exciting and very challenging. Um, Going back to this issue of prophylactic vaccines, so I've told you two approaches for therapeutic vaccines. One is to prevent PKDL, but it's still a therapy because it's given to patients. And the other is, um, is direct therapy in PKDL. What about conventional prophylaxis? And the challenges there are cost, time, the numbers of patients you have to enrol, the vagaries of transmission in the real world. That's not just the case in leishmaniasis. That's true for many, many infectious diseases. And so another thing that the UK funders have been very uh, good at is to now help us try and develop what we call controlled human infection models. In other words, going back to the old days, very old days, where we said the only way we learn about an infection is to give volunteers an infection. Okay? And if you can do that safely with good chemotherapy and intervention at the end of that, then the options for learning about the pathogenesis of disease, because you can start to measure that immune response from day one. The options for using it to essentially put onto the end of a phase one trial. So with the same 20 odd patients that you do your phase one safety study, if you could then challenge them and immediately say, well actually out of those 20 that I vaccinated, 10 of them still got infection, that's not a very good vaccine. Or none of them got an infection, that's a very good vaccine. Okay? 
Um, so we are developing these human challenge models. This is a great website if you want to understand a little bit more about human challenges. There's now at least uh, getting on a dozen different organisms that human challenge models are being set up for. And then if you want to see our own, this is uh, called Leash Challenge, that Jesus is involved in this, Greg partly involved in it. Uh, we're trying to get the whole community involved. And essentially what we're doing is generating a GMP grade stock of Leishmania major parasites. These will be isolated from Israel. Uh, we're validating them through a whole host of safety uh, and um, uh, parasitological and, and identity uh, tests. We're developing with Jesus's help a sandfly protocol for allowing sandfly challenge. Uh, this is a very important part of clinical research now, talking to your volunteers and talking to your patients and making sure they're on board with how you're doing studies. So these are called focus group discussions. And we hope that in about a year's time, we'll start the first sandfly uh, human challenges um, to allow us to uh, really develop a protocol that could be used for testing prophylactic vaccines. And if you think about my first slide on vaccines, those five candidates, how do you decide which of those to spend many, many millions on taking forward? Well, if you could get all of those five candidates plus combinations of them into a test like this, you could actually do that in a very, very efficient way. Okay? And so that's the approach. Um, I've become something of making, I, I think I've spent most of my life making websites these days. So, so <laughs> Leash Challenge, this is a good, this is, I should thank Peter Wolf, actually. He came up with this little symbol, actually, but I think it's a great little logo um, to show that it's, it's a challenge model, sample I initiated, and we think it's got global relevance if we can get it to work. So, so. Okay, there's a couple of extra references here just to, to touch on things. I think this is the one Jesus will probably talk about um, tomorrow, I think. Uh, and this is uh, just the update on the live vaccines. Okay, if I've got five more minutes, I just want to show you one other exciting thing, but it's a game that you can go off and play with later on, so I don't despair. Why do we think we need to worry about having computational models or mathematical models? I've shown you that immunology is incredibly complicated and that everything talks to everything else. And our biggest concern, I think, as immunologists is we're still very reductionist. We're still, let's take one cell and put it in a dish or, or manipulate one cell in a mouse and hope that that tells us the answer. And what we don't have a very good grasp on is how all of these things interconnect together. And importantly, if you interfere with one cell, can you infer that the result you see is because of that cell, or is it because that cell is talking to somebody else, who's talking to somebody else, who's talking to somebody else, and that's the end product? And so your drug target that you might want, or your vaccine target, might be three or four cells removed from the one that you were actually manipulating. How do you map that? Um, and so one of the things that's very valuable about computational models is that you can do dynamic modeling over time, much more effectively than you can uh, sampling in animals or in humans. And you can try and get insights into mechanisms that actually wouldn't be obvious from the experiments you're doing. So I won't go into all this detail, but I, we've been spending probably the last um, eight or nine years trying to say how can we use all of our data from animal models and from uh, human disease, how can we put it into computational models and how can we use that to help us think about either new ways of doing clinical experiments or even better ways of interpreting mouse data. So I'm going to skip out a couple of these because I don't think we'll, we won't worry that model. So this is what we've tried to do, is to generate what we call a virtual laboratory. And it uses a whole range of different modeling approaches. Um, and, and this will be familiar for the modelers and for those who aren't modelers and computational biologists. Um, ignore it, it just says, there are lots of different ways you can construct computational models. We feed into that everything we can find about the immune response, what the cells are, what they're doing, who they're talking to, how drugs work and interfere with those cells, how parasites interfere with those cells. And then we hopefully have something that we can do in silico experiments with. And very simple examples of those questions. The model I'll show you in a minute has about 180 different variables of the immune system within it. If you want to know whether your particular a knockout or a, a drug that affected nitric oxide was going to impact it in this model, you can do an in silico knockout of nitric oxide. And importantly, you can then go back and say, well, what was the impact on all the other parameters of knocking out <coughs> nitric oxide in that model? 
So this is how we sort of put it all together. It took about three, four years to do this. But if this works, I'll just let you at least see where the link is. You will find something called the Lishmania Virtual Laboratory. And what that will do is it will, if you go into the about part of the virtual laboratory, you will get a bit of text that tells you all about how this is set up. If you're interested in the model itself, it has essentially at its core a macrophage that's infected with Lishmania parasites. And everything we think we know about signaling and how Lishmania parasites affect macrophage signaling. It has data that's derived from looking at histopathology in the mouse. And for every infected cell, we've worked out how many other types of cells there are. And so you can see for every infected macrophage in the spleen, there are this number of Th1 cells, there's that number of IL-10 producing cells, there's this number of regulatory cells, etc., etc. This is all real data that's come from uh, in vivo imaging approaches. And these are neutrophils that you can see at different time points. And as you, as you go through the simulation, when you run the simulation, you essentially can get a readout of how every one of those cells is behaving during the course of an infection. And if we look, go into the virtual laboratory itself, um, what it will give you at the end of that is, is a little, it'll tell you how to use this as a little crib sheet, but essentially you can run the whole model. And it takes a little bit of time um, to, to load up, perhaps. Definitely on this web link, a little bit of time to load up. But when the whole, that's the whole model, okay? doesn't tell you anything, does it? <laughs> but the important thing about this, so this is what we put in, this is how we think the immune system to Leishmania works, but you can now design your own experiments. You could go down here and you could click that you want to have a group of three mice, that you want to have um, a comparison here, you want to do a control, or you want to knock out any one of these different terms. So we could knock out iron, for example. If we knocked out iron and we do an experiment with three mice, we can then run that experiment and we can see what would happen if you had an iron deficiency to the course of Leishmania infection and all the other immunological parameters. So I'm going to stop there because I could talk about this for hours and hours and still wouldn't understand it probably. But if you ever want to play with it, if Peter hasn't uh, saturated you with bioinformatics, um, this is another approach that anyone who has that sort of geeky mentality can get into. So thank you very much. We'll stop for coffee and then I'll come back later.